I wanted to start out by reading from an article from the Financial Times, certainly an organ of global capital, um, that came out in November of 2015 announcing the recipient of Financial Times and McKinsey's company's annual Business Book of the, of the Year Award. Um, so the headline is, A bleaker view of our automated future comes to the fore. Um, winning title, The Rise of the Robots is Dystopian Bookend to the World is Flat, on, uh, um, which was the winner in 2005 of the FT and McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award. Um, the story reads, Martin Ford's uh, book, The Rise of the Robot, this year's business book of the year, is in some ways the dystopian bookend to Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat, which won the first Financial Times Prize for compelling business books 10 years ago, where Mr. Friedman was breathlessly optimistic about the prospects for a working world connected, lubricated, and energized by technology Mr. Ford, a software entrepreneur, is much more pessimistic. He envisages a world of fewer jobs and relentless pressure on both manufacturing and professional workers as machines take over an increasing range of tasks. If action is not taken, inequality will increase, a phenomenon also addressed by Thomas Piketty in the, the previous year's winning book, Capital in the 20th First Century and economic growth could stall. At Tuesday's judging session for the Financial Times and McKinsey book, Business Book of the Year, Sriti Vadera, Bard member and former UK business minister, said Mr. Ford's book pointed to an incredibly turbulent time as we adjust to a change more profound than the Industrial Revolution. As Mr. Ford writes, while human machine collaboration jobs will certainly exist, they seem likely to be relatively few in number and often short-lived. In a great many cases, they may also be unrewarding and even dehumanizing, unlike what kind of work. Um, Mr. Ford warns in the book that a fundamental restructuring of our economic rules may be needed to mitigate the impact of the advance of robotics and automation. He proposes a guaranteed minimum basic income or it's more commonly known as universal basic income now, or citizen's dividend as one radical remedy. Um, so this was really the, I think, one of the kickstarters of the current fad of interest about uh, UBI among the tech elite, the, the awarding of this prize to Ford's book in 2015. Um, the story continues a bit after that. The, the Second Machine Age uh, by An Eric Brynjolfs and, and, and Andrew McAfee, um, which was a runner-up for the award that year, is notably, notably more optimistic about the jobs that will be created as a result of the technology revolution. I should note, Brynjolfs was at MIT had previously uh, speculated that as many as 50% of workers around the world or of people around the world would be unable to sell their labor uh, in any way in the not too distant future. And he's considered an optimist uh, in these circles. Mr. For Ford's first book, The Lights in the Tunnel, was attacked for being too gloomy. But as Edward Luce wrote, reviewing the rise of the robots for Financial Times, his latest work is well-researched and disturbingly persuasive. Mr. Ford holds out the slim hope that if handled pr properly, the technology revolution could usher in an automated utopia of greater prosperity and leisure. But he warned on Tuesday as he received the award that his predictions could unfold faster than we expect, sweeping away the advantages of education and training. Even, if peop even people, he says, that do everything that, that they are supposed to do to get a good job may find it difficult to get a foothold in the economy. Um, that's, I guess he's saying that's in the future. That'll be the case. Um, he told the New York audience. Um, the story was picked up by various outlets, and in Midas PR News reported uh, Dominic Barton, who is global managing director of McKinsey, as saying, uh, 
While no one can be certain how the future will unfold, this year's winner delivers an important message. Companies and governments are racing into a world where both work and the workforce will need to be radically redesigned. So we're hearing this more and more. And the, the panel for uh, judging this award was, um, was a stellar group of uh, global capitalists. Um, we had uh, the chief economics advisor at Allianz, um, Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn and part partner at Greylock, who's one of our graduates who actually expressed skepticism about the um, inevitability of universal basic in income and a hope that it could be avoided. Um, Herminia uh, Ibarra um, for, of INSEAD um, in Europe was another uh, judge, Rick Kirkland from McKinsey, um, and so on. I would say, um, so before we talk about this, I, I want to clarify, based on this morning session, that fighting against the gig economy through things like uh, portable safety net, also exposing and ending wage theft, and organizing workers in Silicon Valley are all vitally important uh, for us to do. But we also need to think about and get ahead of this envisioned future that's being so widely talked about now, um, especially among the elites. In this future, the gig economy is the tip of the spear in a, in a larger plan, in which the successor to the gig economy is the no gig economy. No jobs, no gigs, no outsourcing, nothing for a large fraction, perhaps most, of the working class globally. Um, and the solution that they're bandying about is this universal basic income, or UBI. So um, recently there was another article about this in the Chronicle by, um, San Francisco Chronicle by Kathleen Pender. So I'll quote a little bit from, about that because she talks more about the, a little bit of the details and who supports this. She says, the ideal of a universal basic income, monthly cash payments from the government to every individual working or not with no strings attached is gaining traction thanks in part to endorsements from Silicon Valley celebs. Some see it as a way to compensate for the traditional jobs with benefits that will be wiped out by robotics, AI, self-driving vehicles, globalization, and the gig economy. Others see it as a way to reduce income inequality or to create a more efficient, less stigmatizing safety net than our current mishmash of welfare benefits. This is a quote, I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. I don't think we are going to have a choice. This is from Tesla CEO Elon Musk at the World Government Summit in Dubai in February of this year. Then, as Steve mentioned, in a commencement speech at Harvard in May, Facebook C CEO Mark Zuckerberg said, we should explore ideas like universal ba basic income to give everyone a cushion to try new things. And in July 4th, blog post just this month, Zuckerberg praised Alaska's permanent fund dividend, the nearest thing to universal basic income in this or any country. Um, since 1982, Alaska has been distributing some of its oil revenue as an annual payment ranging from $1,000 to $3,000 a year to every re resident, including children. Um, so there are various supporters for UBI with very different agendas who mean very different things by it. And this is what one of the things I think we need to discuss. There's been uh, support for UBI on the left for a long time. And um, Eric Roland Wright, who's a sociologist, Marxist sociologist at, at University of Wisconsin, is one of the prominent writers who's written in favor of this. There's a classical Marxist argument for UBI, which is that it's needed to prevent workers from being exploited. Um, and then there's dispute about whether that applies under socialism. But, um, you know, of course, there's also the idea, going back to Marx and earlier, of from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. The first part of that um, would is, has historically been used as a basis for enforcing work requirements uh, within socialist economies or, or arguing that that's an important component in addition to the to each according to their needs part. So this is a little bit different from uh, what historically socialism has meant to a lot of people. 
Other people come from different perspectives. So economists tend to emphasize, academic economists who are not socialists or Marxists, emphasize the greater neutrality of UBI with respect to incentives compared to means-tested welfare benefits, the idea that since you're always receiving UPI, it's not going to cause you um, to not work because you, know, you would be losing your welfare benefits. Political scientists tend to emphasize the universality of it as a means of um, building broader and stable public support. Sociologists emphasize the less stigmatizing character of something that everybody received compared to social welfare programs that are based on poverty status or unemployment. The CEOs that we're hearing are often uh, talking about the need to preserve their customer base. Um, liberals uh, who may feel a certain <coughs> guilt might echo um, this quote I'm going to read from Mark Zuckerberg from CBC, CNBC. He says, we should have a society that measures progress not just by economic metrics like GDP, but by how many of us have a, have a role we find meaningful. We should explore ideas like UBI to give everyone a cushion to try new things. This was said at Harvard. Um, he later says um, that if he hadn't been comfortably finan comfortable financially as a kid, his dad was a dentist, then he might not have created Facebook. I know lots of people who haven't pursued dreams because they didn't have a cushion to fall back on if they failed, said, said Zuckerberg. We all know we don't succeed just by having a good idea or working hard. We succeed by being lucky, too. If I had to support my family growing up instead of having time to code, if I didn't know it would be fine if Facebook didn't work out, I wouldn't be standing here today. So there's some self-consciousness, um, at least uh, in that statement, that I think is notable. On the other hand, there are libertarians um, represented, for example, by Charles Murray, a libertarian with the American Enterprise Institute, who's proposed a basic income plan that would replace all transfer payments, including welfare, food stamps, housing subsidies, the earned income tax credit, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It would also eliminate farm subsidies and corporate welfare, he says. Um, and his plan, I think it's worth looking at the details because we can start to see what we're talking about. In exchange for eliminating all of those programs, each American older than 21 would get a monthly payment totaling $13,000 a year, of which $3,000 would go to health insurance. After $30,000 in earned income, got from a job, a graduated tax would reimburse some of the grant until it dropped to $6,500 at $60,000 in income, but the grant would never drop below $6,500 to compensate for the loss of Social Security and Medicare. Murray admitted that seniors would get more than $6,500 worth of benefits a year from those two programs, which is why it would have to be phased in. But then he says, what I'm proposing would actually be cheaper than the current system, it would give adults a living income and liberate people who are tied to a job or welfare program in a particular city because they can't risk leaving to pursue a new opportunity. So for Charles Murray, he likes the idea because it's cheaper, because it saves the government money, right? I think we should also notice that UBI is much more popular in the topic right, right now among elites than proposals for full employment, workers' rights, why is that? So summing up, uh, I would say when you hear someone advocating UPI, pay attention to the details of the proposal um, because they're not at all created equally. And that to the extent that we want to embrace the general concept, UPI should be one component of and not a substitute for a program of liberation and justice alongside workplace and labor protections, the rights to organize, and continuing the constant struggles in which all of us are already engaged. Can you hear me this way or? Not through the microphone, okay. Maybe you have to hold it right up. So. Maybe just push it back. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Todd, for a great introduction uh, of 
robotics and uh, automation and uh, consequences of you know what we could expect or what the ruling classes are kind of uh, speculating. But how do we get there? Uh, what happens behind the scenes as uh, the workers in IT and uh, you know robotics, uh, computers, networks, uh, cloud systems, what happens behind the scenes? Uh, today we are seeing that IT is the privileged in the working class. Uh, we see people from Google and Facebook come in with cash burning their pockets and buying homes in San Francisco where nobody can, can afford. But are we really privileged? Are we really uh, apart from the working class? That's what I wanted to bring today on what's happening in the IT and, and the way that the IT workers themselves are being exploited and are being directly subject to the methods of discipline that the working class endured and saw before it came to IT. Um, one of the, uh, I think, eye-opening things that I observed was the film that it was showing Steve Jobs as the, you know, the Apple's uh, creator. Um, He's identified as having started with the PC revolution and succeeding against the odds. In there, we see that the workers don't exist. It is one genius that goes in with his idea of creating a personal computer that would revolutionize the world. And it's him alone, nobody else. It doesn't exist. Just like uh, remember reading when you were kids, maybe the Robinson Crusoe book. What happens in Robinson Crusoe, it's a very political book by the way, is that it has nothing to do with an adventurer you know, in an island. It shows the ideology of the ruling classes as they try to completely wipe away the working class. We don't need them. If you are an individual, if you are determined, even if you are stuck in an island, you can do it. That's the ideology that we'd like to, uh, they, they want us to see. But there nobody talks about the education, the public education that uh, Robinson Crusoe had before he landed in the, in the island. He uses that knowledge that he acquired from the society and then, of course, we forget that all kinds of pans and equipment that washes to the sea uh, from, the, from, the, from the ship to the island that he uses. We never get to know who created those pans, who created those writing instruments that he can navigate the knowledge. All of those completely disappear. And that's what we are seeing over the ages, that the capitalists would love to see an economy where, or a world where the working class doesn't exist. So in, in Jobs' film, uh, we see that a screen where suddenly a completed Macintosh computer is on a desk for Steve to demonstrate to eagerly waiting investors and crowds going wild to celebrate the new arriving technology that can allow people to draw abstract pictures on the screen. That's all he does. The creation is to be understood as the brainchild of Steve Jobs, the genius. Nowhere we see a single worker, as, uh, as if those computers, boards, interfaces, open architecture, serial buses, chips, firmware, solders, breadboards, screens, software, plastic, enclosures, keyboards, just appear in nature. That's what we see in the, in the film. Um, one, uh, again, a screen is that when Steve Wozniak remarks that Jobs is not an engineer and has contributed to nothing in the development of new technology, by stating slowly, he turns to Steve Wozniak, who is an engineer, and he says slowly to let it sink in, he says, I am the orchestrator. I am the conductor of this orchestra. You are a good musician, 
So sit down where you belong and play your music. That is the uh, message we get from the ruling classes that we should know our place, although we produce it, but we should know our place, sit down and just observe the orchestrator. So how did the workers disappear from our daily world? How did we accept this? Remember when Trump uh, started banning the foreign workers, suddenly the Silicon Valley started stirring up because these cheap and very skilled workers that the IT needs today was uh, you know, being prevented from coming. So it wasn't the humanitarian side saying, how can you stop people from you know, pursuing their whatever life and everything? It was that you are preventing our cheap resources so that we can make billions in profit. You are preventing us. That is when the workers started to appear in our world that, hey, they were part of this production. Um, we, at, at, at a certain point, kind of accepted it. And IT is kind of, IT workers are to blame for this as well. Because we are being fed that we are privileged, we get uh, better pay, and we are the brain of this whole thing. So, of course, we are not work in the working class. And I've seen this in over 40 years of my IT profession. Whenever I talk to anybody that works with me, not a single person up to now has admitted that they are, from, they are a part of the working class. They all identify themselves as, as the professional. We are the professionals. We are not of the working class. I remember one night sitting at 9 o'clock working for free to make a deadline. A, Bunch of us were uh, discussing, and so finally a friend, he said, you know, I am not the working class. My mother is the working class who cleans offices. I am professional. Refusing to identify in the class process or in the production process, in the ownership of uh, means of production that he was part of the other. Um, in a recent, also in a recent DevOps conference, I started explaining that what goes around comes around. Meaning that what the working class in the auto industry, in shipping, in everywhere else, in manufacturing faced is now coming to us. So I said, uh, I asked uh, the, our you know, uh, audience, to step down from their high horses because the time is here. There was an astonishing silence for some time as people turned next to whoever was sitting and rolled their eyes saying, this guy's crazy, we are, we, are, we are there, we are at the top of the wave now. So there was another instance when, uh, when uh, somebody that worked for me, we are meeting with a user, there's an implementation that is going on. A group had worked for months to produce a program that would make it easier for the users. We were, uh, you know, instead of us working for, you know, half an hour or 45 minutes to do a job, we were giving a solution where the users would press a button and it would be done automatically. So one of, the, uh, one of my coworkers got really ahead of himself and he started saying to the users, saying, we have no value here. You have to eliminate us. This is what we are doing. You have to take my job away from me. Uh, this is the best way to do, and you will do it eventually eliminating me. He was not even aware as a worker, as a creator, that the group right next to him had worked for months, if not years, to create this program. He was concentrating on that one little button and completely forgetting the work that was done next to him, thinking that just giving a simple stupid button was enough to eliminate jobs and, uh, and create efficiency. But this also shows how we have uh, we have identified with and accepted the ideology of the capitalists that the working class, even though they are next to us, uh, creates nothing. 
and we have, even our co-workers have become invisible to us, even though we work eight hours or ten hours with them. Um, today, methodologies very similar to what the uh, you know, manufacturing went through, the manufacturing workers went through, are being applied in the information technology workers. Uh, they have very fancy names. The last buzzword is the DevOps. Before that it was, it, and still is the agile methodology, and only, you know, like maybe few months or, you know, uh, old is the DevSecOps, where the uh, development and the operations and the security all are combined in together, and we have these buzzwords that people love to do. But uh, this is nothing new, as I was saying in that conference. We are just experiencing what other factories in manufacturing are doing because IT is nothing else today. As one of the DevOps engineers openly says for Microsoft, he admits, he says that DevOps is the factory floor of the 21st century. This is what it is. So let's step down for, from our high horses. This is what's happening. Uh, when we go back, what was, what was this thing called management, scientific management? This is what we are seeing in IT. It's just the scientific management. Uh, the management of workers became a central issue after workers were gathered for factories at the dawn of capitalism. Earlier, when workers started to work in the factories, instead of doing piecemeal work at home, they brought with them the previous work ethics and traditions. Of course, this did not bode well with the discipline required by capitalism where steady, reliable production with a constant quality had to be maintained. I want to emphasize on this. Steady, reliable production with constant quality. This was imposed upon the production where capitalist production relies on re reliable production of the others. The, 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 the um, raw material or the electricity or uh, you know, whatever is needed for production has to be there in order to meet deadlines, what's called the lead time. Lead time is the time when you get your order to the time you deliver. This time has to be as compressed as possible and the output has to be delivered on time so that the profits could be realized, not made, realized. Realization of profits are made only when the sale happens. And this is now what the IT is experiencing and these methodologies called agile and DevOps are just yet another word of the scientific management where we apply the, uh, the methods that were done on the factory floor. Um, by accepting the ideology, actually what we have done, like my co-workers had you know, expressed, was that the acceptance of submitting the power of knowledge, the power of the workers hold. This was, this is a constant class struggle that happens at workplaces every single day. It is that who holds the power, and that power is knowledge. The traditionally the working class, by the fact that their hands are in production, held this power. And in IT, of course, it is the knowledge. So this power was submitted by the working class to management throughout the, uh, through, throughout the development of capital. And of course, it was wrestled from them in a very planned, scientific way. So, by accepting the power of the capitalist through the ownership of the means of production, the labor process now becomes the property of the capitalist. We have given that process, the labor process, that was ours, we have given it to the bosses. And now they can experience, uh, they experience that, that power on us to organize us any way they want in the speed up and or to, you know, uh, discipline us. And this transition of ownership of the labor process is what can be precisely called the management. So this is the management, given away of the labor process. Um, as Karl Marx indicates, every day two armies get together 
and they have, they, they are at war. And this war is the class war as we see it. And as class was, uh, defines, it is a movement in a resistant medium because it involves the control of, of refractory masses. This is the war that, that seizing the knowledge, seizing the labor process, seizing the control of production and giving it to the management. Um, One of, the, one of the methods originally used to wrestle that knowledge away from the workers as Adam Smith, as one of the leaders of this ideology was, the division of labor. It seems very natural that today, especially after all these years, that the pr production, the process of production is so well uh, the divided among laborers. Um, the society has natural division of labor that we have seen through the years. But with capitalist production, with especially theorizing by Adam Smith, he was able to demonstrate that even to produce a simple pen, as his you know, very famous, uh, uh, very famous uh, example, it involved 18 different processes. So he divides the making of a pin into 18 different parts. This seems natural to us now that we've lived through it. But what they are looking at this is not just the ease of producing something. The, what comes out of this is the maximization of profit so that first of all, maximization of profit, second, de-skilling of the labor. Uh, labor, the workers. And through this desecularization, what happens is that the wages are lowered. So you pay less to people who know less and your profits go up. If you have a worker that knows the whole process and does it, you are looking at it as a waste. You, a, a worker should be just doing one thing and one thing only and would not know the rest of it. So that also creates uh, a more uh, independence to the, to the management. Um, 50 years after, uh, after uh, Smith, many others jumped in to analyze what this division of labor is. And uh, Babbage and uh, uh, Andrew Urey uh, was uh, also showing it, uh, that this division of labor actually meant to desecularize the workers. As uh, Urey explains, with the introduction of machinery, process formerly conducted by the cunning workman who is prone to irregularities of many kinds are placed under the charge of a peculiar mechanism so self-regulating that a child may superintend it. Means with machinery, with division of labor, we are becoming more and more stupid. This is what he proposes. Um, the same, same is for the Babbage principle. Uh, again, when you look at it, uh, uh, one of the pioneers in the labor theory and applying it is Braverman, who says, Babbage principle eventually becomes the underlying force governing all forms of work in capitalist society, no matter in what setting or at what hierarchical level. So when we look at this, the same thing applies everywhere and today including IT. So I'm going to go fast a bit and uh, just uh, try to come to, oh yeah, uh, there was an article, uh, again I'm quoting from uh, Braverman, to show that the workers, if they can't disappear, then they are considered as a part of the machinery. And a psychological magazine comes up uh, defining what a uh, person is. Uh, of course, in the, uh, in the uh, view of, uh, of a worker. An article in the British Journal of Psychiatry Apple entitled Theory of the Human Operator in Control Systems uh, says, as an element in a control system, a man may be regarded as a chain consisting of the following items. One, 
sensory devices, two, a computing system which responds on the basis of previous experience, three, an amplifying system, the motor nerve ending and muscles, four, mechanical linkages whereby the muscular work produces externally observable effects, meaning that we are nothing but a machine, and this feeds so well into the capitalist vision that now the workers are associated together, uh, you know, united with the machine, and actually the work is being done by the capitalist himself by conducting, as Steve Jobs does, conducting this whole thing that is a mixture of machine and man together. This is how they look at us. So. Um, Going to IT, uh, speeding up here, the division of labor also applies in IT, but it's contradictory. The chaotic world of capitalism and also much more applied to IT shows itself when there are different and contradictory methods that are being proposed. Uh, one is, of course, the uh, profit generating uh, division of labor as Smith and Babbage and so on and so forth showed, but then, IT is also required to work very closely with each other. So you are dividing people up, and then you are asking them to please come together and work together. This is, the na this is what is called DevOps. Because in IT side, there are two competing sides. One is the operations, DevOps means development, Ops is the operation. Operation side is for stability. You have your servers, you have your network, you have your everything working in harmony. Nothing should be changing from the view of the operations. But then comes the developers who know nothing about this, but they develop means they are in constant change. They want change every single minute. Today in um, Netflix, about I think more than 1,000 changes a day is being introduced into the stable server environment. 1,000 changes a day. In the bank that I work for, if we do four, we look at ourselves as, wow, successful. <laughs> so this is where we are going. Operations complains that too much change is coming and it's disrupting the work, and the developers are saying, we don't care, just change it. This is what we are tasked to do. So bringing it together against the division of labor is the DevOps. They ask us to look at things as from the perspective of the capitalist and go beyond ourselves uh, and sometimes do this division, sometimes get together. So this is the whole idea behind the DevOps. Now, Agile has been around. That's another methodology that they use. Agile is, uh, first of all, the propaganda. Agile tells us that with Agile, everything works so well, so good, that it's organized. The chaos is gone. So finally, we can do work as it should be done. But before I say that, let's go back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith uh, talks from two sides of his mouth in 1700s. First, he comes to workers. He says, you know, guys, this division of labor is so good for you. You're going to be so uh, content. You're only going to be doing one thing, but you're going to do it well. Your life is going to be in harmony. You're going to be so, I don't know, uh, satisfied with your work. And then he turns around and talks to the capitalists that he's selling this to. He says, this work is going to degrade the workers so bad that they're going to live in hell. I mean, he doesn't say it in that word, but he says, it's going to make them so dumb and stupid that their life is going to be boring and unbearable. Look at the way that the two sides talk of the, uh, the same guy. Now we come to agile. And we, we hear that by doing agile uh, methodologies, the way that we produce, it's going to make things so well and so easy for us. What is this chaos working late at night and this and that is going to just disappear and everything's going to be milk and honey. Then you go to the class, a class in agile, the first page. You open up, oh, you're going to take this online class. You want to learn about this, do it well. So on the first page, uh, uh, the first presentation is what the agile process is not. So here comes. Um, 
agile, uh, 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 it is diffusing the popular myth about it, and uh, it, with a big banner on the first page saying false, is that agile needs more discipline from the team, and what gets done should be led from a specific role, usually the business analyst. First of all, they took the control from you. If developers are doing what they like, then there is a failure of this role. So here is what they say you can do, you're going to do, you're going to be free, da, da, da. And on the first page of an agile course, it says, don't believe it. Uh, if, if you are doing what you like, something is wrong here. Um, to, just to show that this agile methodology was only. Oh, agile is this. Uh, OK, there are two methods of producing. One is called waterfall. Waterfall, I'll explain those. The other one is agile. Waterfall is this. Suppose you are producing a software. Uh, the business comes to you and says, I want you to create a website, OK, with the pictures on it. That's it. You go, you go back, and you work on it for, let's say, six months. And then you come back, and you produce what you, you show them what you produced. Six months, you were not there. You did your work behind the scenes. You come back and deliver after six months. Agile says no. Agile methodology is this. When I tell you to create a website, you don't go away and come back after six months. Every week or two weeks, we have a meeting. You must deliver something, something. I don't care what. You must deliver. I need to see you working every single moment. Sometimes every day, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but again, going back to the logic behind this, it is like a factory. You don't tell some factory to, oh, just create me a car. Every day you have to see, did you do the tires? How is the windshield going to be? I want to see, see deliveries every day so that I know my, uh, you, you have a reliable, steady production. So this applies to software is Agile, but there's more to it than that. Is that in Agile, especially in the Scrum methodology, they call it, every day a team, the production team meets, and it's a social shaming. Everybody has to say, I've done my job, I've done my job, yes, I've done what I was given, and then if there's somebody behind, well, I couldn't do it, sorry, I did like about 25, 30 people looking at him or her, and then that needs to speed up. So that the delivery, which is like godly laws, that delivery has to be done. And this is causing tremendous, tremendous uh, stress on the workers. Now they have to deliver, deliver on time, deliver on quality. Everything has to be done. And this is not really easy at all, and uh, uh, constant pace of delivery has to be imposed on that. So anyway, the DevOps is, again, I mentioned that, the, you know, bringing in, but if you look at the literature behind both Agile and DevOps, nearly every other paragraph imposes that ideology, that production has to be done on time and efficiently, and it has to adhere to the, uh, to the laws of profitability. That is what is behind it. And so, uh, again, let me cut it short, is that this is, uh, again, only the rep repetition of what the other workers around the world and in factories have seen. Now, uh, you know, the world is turning and it's coming to us because IT is central. And most of the, uh, you know, expenses of the capitals in production in IT is happening in IT. So now the focus is on us. And uh, it's very unfortunate that the, uh, you know, the IT workers uh, mostly do not consider themselves in the working class and do maybe not contribute to the to the to the uh, uh, um, struggle but i'm sure it is changing because uh, nothing else is is considered as valuable as making deadlines meet that lead time and making profits of course that's going to affect that i don't know if you want to contribute as well to it yeah no. Let's take a look at what the problem is, and then look at you know how many times they uh, do that. When you have huge systems, you touch something, 
just change the color of a screen, let's say. Seems like simple, you know, stupid thing that you can do in 10 minutes, right? No, exactly. You touch it and there's the risk of bringing down the whole system. So the new method of doing things is that very little, very little programs that each talk to each other so that's called the microsystem. So when you can that then do is that touch one thing and it doesn't bring down the whole system. This architecture allowed them to do changes where we cannot do it in our systems. The reason is that for everything that we do, it has to have days and days of testing, even one simple stupid change. It yes. No, no, it's uh, artificial intelligence is there, but it has not really made its way into majority of the IT world today. Okay, there, there are, it's trying to come in. But this is, the, this is the limitation of production then. We are delaying by only doing three or four changes to the system, we are delaying the capitalists from making profits. But by, if you change your architecture, to allow changes to come in, thousands in a day, then what happens is that that lead time, lead time to, to realize your profit comes tremendously small. So you can do these. Even if you make a mistake, no worries. You can pull it back, you can put it back in again 10 minutes later. We, in our systems where I work, we don't have that. But uh, again, Netflix is a pioneer. Now Amazon and the others are going into this methodology. But let's keep in mind what these are for. So that profits could be maximized. But the, uh, but the stress that it puts on the developers is unbelievable. Brand new technology comes in, so now everybody has to learn this, what, the, what Netflix did, how they implement. Well, Netflix has tens of thousands of servers. They have the money. But now the management, who, who will not buy tens of thousands of servers, wants the developers to do that. So now you got to produce as, as a developer, as a worker, but you are not being given them. It's just like you know, going to your local repair shop and asking uh, them to produce what Tesla is doing today. Well, Tesla is doing, why can't you? That's the pressure that the developers are under. Uh, just add to, I think there's, um, to add a little bit on the imperative of changing things rapidly, that we can get a sense of the difference in um, capitalist information technology versus alternatives that we might favor more by looking at, by comparing sites like Netflix and also Facebook, which uses a similar kind of philosophy. If now it's not no longer move fast and break things, it's move fast with stable infrastructure. But the imperative of constantly changing things, um, always new features, uh, is really is driven by the profit motive. And it, we can, as a user, uh, you can compare that to your experience if you use Wikipedia, which has been a very popular and stable and useful tool now for 15 years. Um, and it's changed relatively little and very gradually over the years because it's a democratically governed, not profit driven um, organization. And, you know, so there, it's not inevitable that in technology that in order th for things to happen, it has to be uh, so frenetic like this. It really is a function of the underlying ownership uh, model and incentives. Also, Film directors also have an ideology. They may know it or they may not. They may be just repeating the ideology that's, that has been given to them, and the worldview that they reflect in their film reflects that. So. I, I actually don't agree that we don't know where automation and technology is going. We have evidence of it. For example, call centers. What's happening to call center workers? That was supposed to be a new job for people around the world. Now it's being automated through AI and, and other technologies. Uh, interpreters. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the interpreter who is going to be here, uh, Lisa Milas, was not able to get off work. But their jobs are being automated, I mean, through video uh, and through other technologies. The fact of the matter is the capitalists are automating 
large numbers of jobs out of existence. That's a reality. I mean, that's not, we're not, that's not a prophecy of what's going to happen. That is happening right now. And that is why uh, these capitalists and billionaires are debating about the issue of an a, a, a income because they know a large number of workers are going to be automated. I mean, they're not spending all this money to automate taxis and trucks for, the, for some uh, obscure reason other than they want to profit from getting rid of drivers. I mean, that's what they want to do. And the fact is, is that technology is coming. We can't stop this development of technology. The question is, is how is the working class going to benefit and how can we benefit when you have people who are driven by this pure need for profit? That's what's driving the investment in these technologies, to make greater profits by getting rid of workers. The other contradiction is, as workers' income becomes more marginalized, I mean, their jobs become marginalized, their income declines, and that's what we have even in rich California, all these drivers coming to San Francisco to work at Uber and, and Lyft, they can't survive. Mm -hmm. They can't survive. I mean, they're driving and they're, they're taking these gig and part-time jobs because they can't make it on the income they have. So that means a continuing decline of working class income in the United States. And if you want to look for the reason of the election of Trump, look at what's happening to capitalism. Trump blames the Mexicans. He made bad trade deals. But no, this is capitalism. This is capitalism that's created the dust, the, uh, dust Bowl or the uh, Rust Bowl. This is capitalism that is transforming our country and laying off millions of workers. It's not immigrants. It's not foreign workers. It's the system that is dri driving greater and greater profits at the expense of, of workers and getting rid of unions and having a deregulation of the economy is a good deregulation of work. There used to, taxi cab drivers used to be unionized in San Francisco. They made everybody an independent contractor, including the workers at FedEx. All these new workers who are delivering products, uh, all this pollution, you know, all these deliveries. I mean, they're like, I mean, how do you make money delivering a $10 article? Think about that. I mean, they're delivering $10 articles. You buy something for $10 and a guy or a worker comes and delivers it to your house? Is that really financially viable? How can that be? I mean, it's, they're, they're, it's a system that is really out of control. And as we know from public transportation, and you were talking about BART and public uh, uh, issues, BART is being destroyed by Uber and Lyft. That's what's happening. Um, the airport extension in Oakland is unprofitable now. They're losing millions of dollars. It's cheaper for people to go on Uber and, uh, and Lyft than it is to, get, to take that extension. So public uh, transportation is being destroyed and undermined by privatization of transportation services for profit. And, and that's exactly what's going on. I mean, so just to say, I, I agree with you that the future is hard to predict. Um, I just, you know, I, I do think though, having been participating in, in part of technology for the last 35 years, that um, at least for the last 20 years, it's been relatively easy to see the big trends that are happening, and most of them wind up coming to fruition. So and I think there is a consensus that at least among a lot of people in technology, that at least there's going to be a lot of rapid displacement. The big debate about automation and jobs is whether there are going to be lots of jobs getting created that don't exist now or not. Um, but I think, you know, it seems very likely that we're going to have um, industries like, you know, the ones based on driving that are going to be massively affected, and we, we should think about that. Uh, there are contradictory trends, again. Uh, but the less and less profits is definitely there. But the counterforce to that is monopolization. What we see today, like uh, it's only a few years old, the cloud technology. Uh, what we are seeing is this. In 1960s, 70s, we used to have mainframes. And then they said, no, centralization is not the way to go. We need to do, you know, uh, divide this. So we started seeing mini computers and then PCs, when they said, no, distribute the whole thing. We should not have central place. Then now, cloud technology is bringing back that 1960s centralization again, but with one, one difference. 
In 1960s and 70s, the mainframes used to be in-house. We used to have big, huge computers where our staff worked on it. But now, only a few companies are surviving with cloud, which means uh, your processing is now happening at Amazon, at IBM, Microsoft. These are the, like the three or four companies that dominate the entire market. So now, each product, let's say that you are, uh, I don't know, you are a company, let's say Kronos is a timekeeper company. Instead of selling you software, they sell you two things now. They sell you the software, but they say, you know what, fire off your IT staff. Who, who wants, are you, a, are you a business doing, you know, I don't know, uh, cooking or a restaurant or hotel management? Or are you an IT shop? Hey. Why you keep these IT people, servers and networks and programmers and all of that? We will do it for you. We are on the internet. Hey, we take care of the network. We take care of everything. Come to our side, the cloud side, and we will do everything for you. Half the price of what your IT does. This is how the profits in monopolization are happening. That's how they are able to stay alive. I agree, there's a lot of you know, little, little co you know, competition everywhere, but they will be eliminated. Well, how can we do anything without Microsoft products? I look at these tools as the old days machines. If we, if we are on the web, you have to have Google tools. You have to have things that come from the monopoly of maybe 10, 15 companies. If you are doing deployments, if you are doing builds, which are essential to, uh, to uh, bringing your services to the web, you are using maybe five or at most six companies' products, Jenkins and Maven and so on and so forth. So there's huge uh, monopolization. That is the counter of losing uh, profits, as you mentioned.